Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, we're just gonna wait about two more minutes as we have uh, a few people asking about questions on, on joining. So bear with us for two more minutes and then we'll get started. For those of you that just joined, we're just waiting about one more minute to uh, get started here. We have a few more that are, are just joining. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kim and I work with Dr. Lasasso um, on his team. I am an additional patient resource for you guys. I'm typically the, one of the first people that you speak to um, in your practice journey and I can answer um, your initial questions and make sure that you get in touch with, with the right person. We thank you guys so much for joining today for this webinar. This is the second webinar in our patient series. And today's webinar is going to focus on the difference between adults and pediatric patients um, throughout the pectus surgical process. Um, just like last time, we will conclude the presentation with a live Q&A session. So you will have the opportunity to ask your questions um, at the very end. Um, so we'll, at the very end of the presentation, we'll also go through um, what that process will look like, but basically we'll just uh, utilize the hand raising option um, in Zoom and we'll call on you and unmute your, um, your speakers in order you, for you to ask that, those questions. Um, one of the, the biggest takeaways I think of, of today's presentation is, and I, we can't stress this enough, is the importance of working with a true uh, surgeon specialist for pectus, especially when it comes to adult surgery. Um, Dr. Lasasso is based in New Jersey, but I will say that the majority of his patients are traveling from out of state and his practice is really set up in a way to accommodate that. So um, for most patients, the only time they're going there in person is for the surgery itself. Everything else can be done over the phone via video conference, uh, phone calls with myself or with Allison, his PA, um, and all testing can be done locally and sent in. So I would encourage everyone to you know, do their research and find that right surgeon for you, like Dr. Lasasso, because it's much more important to find the right specialist than it is to find the closest surgeon. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Lasasso. And again, um, we'll wrap things up at the end with uh, some Q&A. Thanks, Kim. I want to welcome everyone uh, who is uh, tuned into this tonight. Um, it was so gratifying to us, um, the response to our last webinar. Uh, we hope that this one will be equally informative, and we want to encourage you to participate by 
asking questions, um, and know that we are going to continue this series of webinars over the next uh, few months. Um, I hope that all of you, wherever you might be, are safe and your families are safe. Uh, we've had some bad weather here in New Jersey uh, in the last few hours, and uh, there's been uh, a few power outages. I'm coming to you from my home in Edgewater, New Jersey, and uh, I do have a generator. So if I do lose power, I generally will get it back, but it will disconnect me. Be patient, hang in there, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can to finish uh, this evening's uh, uh, webinar. Uh, as Kim said, um, tonight's topic is something that I get uh, asked a lot and uh, is asked of my team a lot. Um, and that is, well, what is the difference between uh, having pectus excavatum as a kid and as an adult? And how is the journey uh, different if one chooses to undergo a NUS procedure to correct that deformity. So this is gonna be the topic tonight. I am gonna be slightly redundant in that I'm gonna review some things that were um, included in uh, the last webinar. Uh, for those of you who participated in that, that webinar, forgive me for you know, going over some material you've heard before, but I just wanna make sure for all the new participants depends that a basic fund of knowledge with regards to uh, pectus deformities is fully understood by everyone so that everyone can get the most out of this experience this evening. So uh, without further ado, um, next slide. Uh, this gives you some uh, background with regards to my education and professional certifications. Um, I went to undergraduate school at Yale University and I went to medical school at the University of Florida. I did my general surgery training at UCLA and Cedar sinai in Los Angeles and I did my pediatric surgical fellowship at Babies Hospital, then Babies Hospital, which is at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York. Following that uh, training, I went back to the West Coast where I worked at the Rady Children's Hospital um, and I directed their chest wall deformities program there from uh, my first operation, which was in 1999, until when I left to come to New Jersey in 2017. I also had an adult program at the Sharp Hospital, which is next door to the Children's Hospital in San Diego, where I did uh, adults meaning uh, um, patients uh, 21 and older. Um, and that program went from about 2005 until 2017. Uh, I am board certified in both adult general surgery and pediatric general surgery. And um, my mentorship in the area of, uh, of uh, the NUS procedure came directly from time spent with Dr. Donald Nuss, who, um, uh, who through his creativity uh, um, uh, developed the Nuss procedure. And um, I, I will forever be thankful to Dr. Nuss for uh, guiding me through my early years uh, mastering his operation and his ongoing uh, friendship and support uh, uh, now that I'm 20 years uh, into that process. There would be no NUS procedure without Donald. There would be no uh, uh, centers of excellence around the country without the mentorship that Dr. Nuss gave to me and others who are committed uh, to treating patients with pectus deformities and doing the NUS procedure. Next slide. So as I said, I've been doing this uh, for 20 years, meaning the NUS procedure, uh, though I was always interested in pectus uh, as a, a clinical condition and uh, was taught during the, my time fellowship how to do the operation that preceded the NUS procedure, that being the Ravitch operation. So I've been doing pediatric surgery 
for over 35 years, 20 years of which I've been doing the NUS procedure. And during that time, uh, I've operated on patients from the ages of 12 to 52. Uh, just slightly less than a quarter of my patients are adult patients. Um, I had a wonderful opportunity come my way in 2017. One of my mentors at Columbia Presbyterian, Dr. Ranjadir Gandhi, um, who I've known for well over 35 years, uh, and his partner, Dr. David Friedman, offered uh, to have me come back to where it all began, so to speak, to the East Coast, to New York, where I was born and trained. And uh, in 2017, I joined them in practice at the Valley Hospital in Ridgewood, uh, New Jersey, where I do all of the adult and pediatric pectus surgery. Next slide. This is, um, back one slide. This is a picture of the entrance uh, to the Valley Hospital, which is part of the Valley Hospital Health System in Ridgewood. Next slide. I wanted to, I was remiss the last time in uh, showing all of you uh, pictures uh, of, uh, of the team. Uh, I'm so blessed to have these uh, talented and dedicated women uh, as part of my team. Um, Allison Tan is a, a recent addition. She's a physician assistant who's board certified and licensed and uh, serves as the liaison between those of you who reach out to me through my website uh, and are first uh, introduced to my practice by contacting Kim Fitzgerald, who does a beautiful job of maintaining uh, the connection to all of you through the website and then passes patients from there to Allison where Allison is always available to do uh, telemedicine conferencing with all of you, help you with your initial questions concerning your condition and concerning how you might interface uh, with me through my practice. Uh, in addition, in the practice, uh, Georgia Cristados is our um, uh, scheduler. She does a lot of the uh, logistical work in getting um, the testing done and getting you integrated uh, into, uh, into the practice from uh, an administrative pers perspective. Georgia is very kind and, uh, and very um, concerned about uh, each individual patient's uh, welfare and well-being, and she does a wonderful job um, uh, meeting the logistical needs that you may have uh, during your journey with us. Uh, in addition, uh, Linda Branca is a uh, insurance uh, specialist. Uh, she has had a lot of experience um, with me uh, dealing with patients from all over the country and the world, for that matter, and helping patients negotiate that uh, uh, interface between you, your insurance company, the hospital, and our practice. So she's extremely knowledgeable. She's also very, very giving of her time. And she's a great resource for those of you who wish to come to New Jersey and are just a little um, uh, concerned and or uh, have questions about how to logistically make that happen. Um, and I know there are a lot of financial questions that all of you uh, uh, have. I would just ask that we um, not get into that tonight. We're trying to stay purely clinical, but know that Linda and my team are available for any and all administrative questions um, that, you, that you may have. Next slide. Tonight, I'd like to talk about pectus in general, making sure that everyone has the fund of knowledge necessary to understand their condition, um, to talk specifically about what is unique about uh, treating a patient who is a pediatric patient, uh, defined as anyone less than 18, and um, and to then talk specifically 
about adult pectus surgery and how that is very unique and can be extremely challenging and discuss how those two patient groups differ both in terms of how they present clinically um, and, and the challenges that each present to the surgeon in terms of correcting them. And then I'll be sure to leave uh, some time at the end for questions and answers. Next slide. First, it's important for you all to understand that pectus uh, deformities are extremely common uh, on any sunny day on a, at a beach or at a lake, anywhere in the world, you are probably uh, stand a good chance of seeing uh, a young boy or a young man with the, excuse me, with the condition. Um, it is a genetic condition. That's important for you to understand. You've inherited this predisposition to evolve this unique uh, configuration to your chest wall. And it really requires both inheriting the genetic condition and then growth and development that causes one to develop one of the three forms of pectus deformity. Um, the most common of which is pectus excavatum or sunkenness. The next most common is pectus carinatum, where your chest protrudes. And the rarest form is that called pectus arcuatum. And that's where the upper chest protrudes and the lower part of the chest is sunken. Regardless of which of those three types you have, the same underlying problem exists. That is, you have the genetic predispos predisposition and then you grow in an abnormal way. And what grows abnormally are the ribs adjacent to your breastbone called the sternum. Those ribs adjacent to your breastbone are made of cartilage. They're called costal cartilage. And those cartilaginous ribs growing abnormally then lead to one of the three forms of pectus that I've just described. It's important to know that this affects both men and women, but much more so men than women. Um, there are four men to every one woman with this condition. Um, so it's important for anyone treating patients with this condition to have the facility to treat both men and women the operation artistically and technically is slightly different when one does a man versus a woman so it's important that anyone doing this work has done an ample number of women uh, along with men next slide So now I'd like to talk about what is unique about kids. And we're going to define kids as uh, between the ages of 12 and 18, because that's generally the time in which uh, kids will undergo correction of pectus excavatum. And as you can see with the patient that is uh, depicted in the upper three pictures, that is over about a 10 year period. You see that young man's growth and development. And uh, it's clear that uh, that is a different uh, life uh, period than uh, an adult that comes in and has a very, very fixed deformity that doesn't change during the course of the remainder of their lifetime. You can see in the lower picture that the difference between that chest on the left and the gentleman on the right is about three years, during which time he went from a young man sort of boy chest into 
a more developed uh, adult male chest. And so that is the challenge of operating on patients in this age group that you need to allow for the growth and development of the patient when you correct a patient in this um, uh, time in their life. The deformity is not at its maximum depth during this period of 12 to 18. I like to think of kids in this period of their life as a work in progress. Their chest walls are still growing, they're still evolving, and quite frankly, until they stop growing, their chest is constantly getting worse. To what degree it worsens is unique to that given individual, but the take-home message is that a person at 12 with pectus excavatum is not the same person uncorrected that would be in the office six years later at 18. During that time, genetics and growth will cause that degree of sunkenness to worsen. And that's important to understand. But given the fact that it will deepen, the chest of a kid, the chest of a young adult, is one that is flexible. And that flexibility of the young chest is what makes it easier to correct someone who is in that age group as compared to someone who is older. The other thing that's quite different is that most young adults don't have other serious medical conditions. So you're just dealing with them as a patient with isolated pectus excavatum. You're not dealing with other medical conditions that could complicate the correction of that condition. In addition, for those of you who are kids or for those of you who are parents, you know just how active and fit kids are just because they're kids. Uh, they have more cardiopulmonary reserve. And as a result, kids will tend to come to me with much less severe symptoms. Those symptoms are generally shortness of breath and fatigue with aerobic exercise. In general, those patients who are below the age of 18 have symptoms which are much less pronounced than patients who are older. Uh, I get asked a lot, what is the ideal age for patients to undergo a NUS procedure if they're below 18? And I say that the best time is somewhere between 13 and 15. And I say that because one, because a patient is a work in progress, at 13, 14, or 15, they still haven't expressed the full extent of their chest wall deformity. They're still a work in progress. And as a result, by correcting someone before they've reached their maximum level of of, of um, sunkenness, you're avoiding having to do more work in some cases because in later years, in the later teen years, they can develop a severe enough deformity that they might require more than just a single bar. So by avoiding the development of the deformity to its max Maximum. You can avoid the disfigurement that will inevitably come later in those teen years, and you will have a, um, a, a condition that doesn't require maximum surgical intervention. I also think it's very important in dealing with young adults that um, they be um, mature enough to participate 
in the uh, decision with regards to having an operation and feel as if they are um, uh, interested and willing to uh, participate in the recovery, which is uh, uh, months uh, uh, in the making, meaning that physical therapy is a necessity in order to achieve the best outcome. And you want someone who is uh, mature enough to understand the importance of not only going through the operation, but also participating and being compliant with regards to the recovery, which, as I said, uh, is, um, is, is, is approximately eight weeks in duration. Next slide. Uh, it's important to understand that kids, because their chests are more flexible, their severity is less, uh, they're less symptomatic, they tend to recover faster. They tend to have less pain, there's less trauma involved in correcting them. You're using fewer bars and, and more minimalistic techniques to, um, uh, to correct a younger person. And, and so the recoveries generally are much, much quicker. Um, what's important with regards to the physiology of growth in kids is to understand that depending on how young they are when you put the bar or bars in, um, that it may take a little bit longer than three years to safely remove the bars. And the reason for that is growth is, is a very important consideration when it comes to outcome. And if you remove a bar or bars from a growing patient, then you, um, you can precipitate and increase the chances of having a recurrence. So it's important to know that it's important to have your provider sensitive to that fact, and um, you need to make sure that uh, bars in growing patients are not removed prematurely. Next slide. In adults, which we're gonna define as over uh, 18 years of age, um, they're no longer growing. So this issue of, um, of will this get worse in terms of the degree of sunkenness is off the table. Uh, the patient has maximally expressed the deformity and for that individual as an adult, the result that they have, are left with, the degree and severity of their sunkenness is fixed at that point because they're no longer growing. On the other hand, they have reached maximum severity. And that's why doing it a little earlier in life is so beneficial because you've actually avoided the full expression of the deformity by intervening earlier in uh, a child's life. Because the, the, the severity is maximum in an adult, that means that the chest wall is stiffer, it's less flexible. Even the cartilage in the front of the chest that is the source of the deformity is much denser in the adult patient and much more like the bony rib than it is in a child. Also, as part of the development of adults, their chest walls become more, more um, uh, heavier and more developed. There's more muscle and soft tissue that adds to the weight of the chest. And that 
requires more force in order to lift the chest into a corrected position. That sometimes requires assistance from specialized equipment and that's what's depicted on your screen. That's called a rule track retractor. It's a key component in um, the correction of severe adult patients with pectus. It's vital in doing the operation safely and any surgeon who is doing adult pectus surgery needs to have one of these instruments and be very, very skilled in using them in order to achieve the best results and the safest results. In addition, adults, as we age, we can develop other medical conditions called comorbidities, and they're much more common in adults than they are in kids. That makes things more complicated for the surgeon considering an adult for a NUS procedure. Remember, a NUS procedure is a completely elective operation, and therefore it's important for you as an adult with comorbid conditions to have a frank conversation with your surgeon and for that matter, with your internal medicine doctors treating you for these other medical conditions, be they diabetes or hypertension, high blood pressure, vascular disease, connective tissue diseases, whatever it might be, it's important for there to be a conversation between your medical doctors and your surgeon regarding how those comorbidities are being managed, the success of that management, and confirmation that you can safely undergo this elective surgical procedure to correct your chest wall deformity without undue risk. So it's very, very important to be respectful of any comorbidities and make sure that everyone in, on your team is on the same page with regards to clearance to safely proceed with this correction. I wanna talk about something that's also very, very, very much a part of um, the adult experience. I like to call this the perfect storm. And what that is, is that as we age, we all, even those of us who are uh, extremely dedicated to maintaining our cardiopulmonary fitness, we have a slow, inevitable loss of cardiopulmonary fitness as a result of the aging process. With adults with pectus excavatum, especially those who have a severe form of this uh, deformity, their chest wall is causing their heart to be compressed and to be displaced. And as a result, that affects the circulation between the heart and the lungs, which then make it more inefficient for your heart and lungs working together to oxygenate your blood. You subjectively as adult feel that as shortness of breath and a lack of endurance when you do things that are aerobically challenging. As you age, that inefficiency, that disadvantage your heart and your lungs are operating with as a result of your chest wall compressing and displacing your heart adds to the loss of fitness that you've experienced in the aging process and creates more significant symptomatology for adults with this condition. So the perfect storm is something that I see 
a lot in older patients coming to me with this condition and are having more symptoms and are quite frankly much more concerned about the quality of their life and much more interested in discussing what their surgical options may be in correcting uh, the deformity. Because of a stiffer skeleton, more muscular development, it is very common, much more common in adults to require multiple bars. So as I've just discussed, special equipment and special techniques um, and uh, a facility in, um, in implanting multiple bars are just a few examples of why anyone doing adult NUS surgery has to be extremely experienced. And not just experienced in doing the NUS procedure on younger patients. They have to be experienced in doing adults and dealing with the NUS procedure in adult patients. So that's very important when you are out there as an adult trying to find someone to care for you, that you find somebody who has done a lot of NUS procedures in patients who are over 18 and who have severe deformities requiring multiple bars. Extremely important. Also as a result of the severity, as you would expect, more bars, more specialized equipment, longer operating times. Next slide. Postoperatively, there tends to be more pain, the more work that's needed in order to correct an adult leads to more discomfort, but we're not any less successful in controlling the pain that adults have as we are with kids. It just requires adult dosing and meticulous collaborate collaboration with pain management specialists as part of your team to ensure that the adult patient is as comfortable as the 13 or 14 year old. And I can assure you that that can be achieved. Um, for those of you who heard uh, my last webinar, you know that pain management is critical in doing the NUS procedure well, and that pain management is done using multiple drugs that work in concert with one another to lower and if not almost eliminate uh, the pain that is associated with the procedure. So it's crucial that you know that there's the possibility of more pain as a result of having an adult deformity, but also know that, that it, can be, it can be very successfully treated if the right, the right approach is taken. Uh, physical therapy, just as it is with kids, is really important with adults, maybe slightly more so with adults because you, you need to uh, uh, regain some of what was lost in a, in a more difficult uh, surgical experience. So physical therapy starts at about the same time in adults and kids at three to four weeks, depending upon the recovery of the individual patient. And it's important to know that physical therapy is crucial in achieving your best outcome and should be something that um, is done with a physical therapist that is being directed by your surgical team and 
there's a program of physical therapy that is in place which addresses the special needs of patients who have undergone the NUS procedure and should last for upwards of eight weeks or twice a week for 16 sessions. As would be expected, adults have careers and, and, and professional lives that need to, be, need to be adjusted and taken in consideration when there's a commitment to undergo uh, a NUS procedure. So it's important for adults to work with their providers and with their employers and um, create enough space in their lives to fully recover from this procedure and re-enter the workplace. That should be at least three weeks and depending upon what one does uh, with regards to their, their profession and career, if it involves more physical activity, then upwards of six weeks should be taken and allowed for in order to physically be um, uh, capable of returning to uh, uh, a workplace which involves a lot of physical, uh, physical labor. Uh, as far as bar removal is concerned, adults can all have their bars removed at three years. They're not growing. They don't need any additional time. And three years uh, is, in my experience, enough time to um, correct the deformity in a permanent fashion and allow bar removal uh, without running any risk whatsoever of uh, any recurrence. I know there's a lot of concern out in the adult world about recurrence, uh, but I have found that if the bars are left in for three years and the operation that was originally done was a good one, meaning that the deformity was corrected, um, in, in an optimal way that patients can rest assured that after three years and their bar or bars being removed, that their correction uh, will uh, maintain itself uh, for the rest of their lives. I want to point out to you the pictures that you see on this slide. Um, that is a patient who I met through uh, an amazing experience I had uh, working with uh, the team uh, on e-network, botched by nature. And this was a, a gentleman who came to me in his mid thirties um, and had a very unique set of circumstances. Um, I won't ruin the story for you. I would just suggest uh, that, you, um, uh, that you search on uh, YouTube for Botched by Nature, Pectus Excavatum, and you can uh, watch the episode and, uh, and see how um, this unique patient uh, um, was, uh, 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 was treated. And I'm, I'm pleased to report that the picture on the left was from just a few weeks ago, and, uh, and the patient underwent successful removal of two bars is back out of his home doing well. So there's a very, very, very happy ending uh, to this uh, botched by nature episode. So I would encourage anyone who has any interest to, uh, uh, to, to, to see the episode. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a good one. Next slide. I want to uh, end tonight by talking a little bit about what's common to both kids and adults, and that is patient selection, uh, the workup for both patients, uh, both patient groups is the same. Uh, one needs to have a MRI of the chest and the heart in order to calculate 
the severity of one's deformity. That's called the Haller calculation. And you can see that that is uh, two measurements that can be obtained off of the MRI at the point where the chest wall is most deformed. And those measurements can be made. And if they are greater than 3.25, then you qualify under the standards of care to have your chest wall corrected. Um, in addition to the Haller calculation, I have found in my practice that an enormous amount of important information can be uh, obtained by doing an MRI, not only of the chest, but also of the heart. And with experienced uh, radiologists who do cardiac MRIs, you can start to correlate uh, the severity calculation with the flow dynamics through the heart especially on the right side of heart circulation. And you can really start to see very clearly how certain deformities are impacting the flow of blood from the heart to the lungs. That's important for patients to understand. It's important for surgeons to understand. And it helps in the approval process to let the insurance company know that this is not purely cosmetic. There are real physiologic implications to the chest wall being sunken and its effect on the heart. So that's a, a great way of documenting that aspect of the condition. In addition, every one of my patients and patients of anyone doing this surgery should include an echocardiogram, an EKG, and a cardiology consult. Everyone should see a pulmonary specialist and have pulmonary function testing. In addition, this, this um, metabolic stress test that I am um, indicating on the slide is extremely important. It again correlates anatomy, with physiology and helps to uh, further define patients who are having symptoms um, by measuring oxygen consumption and doing that under aerobic stress, like on a treadmill or a stationary bike. One can measure this metabolic response to aerobic challenge, compare that to the norms for a given patient's age group and further document that the deformity is actually having a negative effect on the heart and lung circulation. So an important piece of the workup with regards to uh, uh, an understanding of the physiology, the pathophysiology, and having more information to offer to the insurance company for the purpose of, um, of having the procedure approved. We do ophthalmology testing on all our patients, which is helpful in ruling out uh, connective tissue disease, especially Marfan syndrome, and everyone that's going to have a NUS procedure, in my opinion, should have metal allergy testing uh, to avoid that 12 to 15% of patients that have an unknown allergy to metal. Um, the bar that Zimmer Biomet provides us uh, is a stainless steel bar, and there are many allergies to the components of stainless steel that need to be um, uh, tested for. Um, if one has an allergy, then uh, a titanium bar is, is ordered and implanted. So this workup, whether you're a child or whether you're an adult, is critical when it comes to patient selection. So I'm very hopeful that this theme that I've been able to 
you know, share with you today of finding experienced providers, okay? And experienced providers that then are the center of your team, but is surrounded by a team that can do this complicated workup, can then select patients accurately and well, prepare them for the operative journey that lies ahead, and get them through, get you through that part of the journey safely and effectively, which means treating your, doing a good operation, doing the operation that your chest wall demands, and doing it in a way that minimizes trauma, and doing it with other professionals that will minimize your pain and get you through that phase of care to what lies ahead, which is physical therapy that should last until you reach a point three months following surgery. At that point, your provider should see you on some regular uh, basis. I see patients at six months, a year, and then yearly until the bar or bars are removed. So that is the continuum of care. I hope that was helpful to you all to review that once again.